Good evening, everybody. I welcome you all to this webinar on wildlife trade and the global health crisis. I hand over this session to today's moderator, Dr. Ravina Agarwal. Thank you. I'm Ravina Agarwal, and I am the director of the Columbia Global Centers, Mumbai. Um, welcome to this webinar. We're very excited to have you all join us. I, uh, the Columbia Global Centers Mumbai is part of a network of nine global centers of Columbia University in different parts of the world, established with the mission of promoting knowledge exchange and partnerships to address the key global challenges that face the 21st century. This webinar has been co-organized with the Columbia Global Centers Beijing, and I want to acknowledge um, the director there, Helena Xiao, um, and also our outreach partners are the Columbia Global Centers Nairobi. So thank you all, and thank you Aditya Petwal for organizing this um, with me. So wildlife plays a complex and important role in the maintenance of endemic diseases, as well as in the emergence of new diseases. It was established, you know, right from 2008, that the majority of emerging zoonotic infectious diseases originate in wildlife, and that the, and the role that wildlife plays in disease emergence is increasing significantly over time, as can be seen in outbreaks with path pathogens, um, you know, with including Ebola, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, monkeypox, the Nipah virus, Hendra viruses, West Nile virus, and in recent times, of course, the coronavirus of COVID-19. It has been shown that the trade in wildlife and wildlife products represents a significant pathway of risk for the release of pathogens that affect humans, domestic animals, and other wildlife. As wildlife trade markets are widespread in multiple countries, including China and the US, it becomes imperative to understand how the world is thinking about protecting wildlife and curbing the wildlife trade. And for this, we have with us multiple experts from different parts of the world to discuss pertinent dimensions of wildlife, wildlife trade and its impact on biodiversity as well as on global health. I would like to welcome Claudia Dreyfus, who is an American journalist, educator, lecturer, and producer of the erstwhile weekly feature, Conversations With, um, of the science section of the New York Times. Um, professor Dreyfus, and I want to say professor, is an adjunct professor at the School of International and Public Affairs, SIPA, at Columbia University. She's also an instructor of practice at Columbia School of Professional Studies. And she, was, she pioneered a special course which trained scientists on journalism. And her class is called Writing About Global Science for the International Media. Professor Dreyfus is the author of multiple books, including Scientific Conversations, Interview, and Higher Education. Our next speaker is Wendy Hapgood, who is the founder and director of Wild Tomorrow Fund with offices in the US and in Africa. Ms. Hapgood believes that biodiversity loss and climate change are two of the most critical issues facing our planet today. In 2015, she left the finance world to complete her master's degree in sustainability management at Columbia University's Earth Institute, where she studied climate change science and policy, researched the intersection of poverty and rhino poaching, and studied new methods for financing the green economy. She now uses both her business knowledge and her environmental education to help protect our planet's biodiversity. So welcome, Wendy. Our next speak, our third speaker is Abhi Tamim Banak, who is associated with the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, ATRI, in Bangalore. He's a senior, a senior fellow and an, an associate professor, and also the convener of, of the Center of, for Biodiversity and Conservation at ATRI. He's also a fellow of the DBT Welcome Trust Clinical and Public Program. His research areas include animal movement ecology, disease ecology, one health, savanna ecosystems, invasive species, and wildlife in human-dominated systems. Much of his research work focuses on the outcome of interactions between species at the interface of human, domestic animal, and wildlife 
um, in semi-arid savannas and agroecosystems. And our um, fourth speaker is Karen Chinshu. She's the director of the Global Coordination with World Wildlife Fund in China. With many years of service with global Fortune 500 companies, as well as being an entrepreneur on the, in the internet industry, Karen joined an NGO with her passion and commercial experience in 2015. While with WildAid, Karen and the China team generated 200 million US dollars pro, you know, uh, pro bono value per year by promoting the public awareness campaign, when the buying stops, the killing can too. Karen is now leading the Ivory High Impact Initiative, which targets the closure of Asia's ivory markets. So we have an amazing panel with us today. And um, the format is such that I will, I will ask questions of each of our panelists, and hopefully we have a lively and engaged conversation. And then we'll follow this with a Q&A session based on the questions from our audiences. So please do send your questions in uh, throughout the panel. I'm going to direct the first question to you, Abhi. Um, how about we start with a brief history of zoonotic jumps? And also, you know, could you explain to us how a zoonotic jump becomes a global pandemic? Hi, Ravina, and thanks for inviting me on this panel. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you here uh, and to be with, uh, to be of this wonderful panel with all the other experts. Well, you know, we've always lived with zoonosis as long as our association with animals, um, as long as in, in our entire evolutionary history, we've uh, we have lived with uh, pathogens that can transfer from animals to humans. Um, and in fact, we are, we are, we are constantly at risk from, from those pathogens. The pathways that those pathogens may find to humans will differ uh, fairly widely depending on the type of pathogens. So, you know, it could be viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, any of those, and they can all, um, you know, they can cause from mild to fairly severe uh, infections in humans uh, leading up to death. So, uh, you know, we've had several of our global pandemics have in fact been zoonosis. If you take, uh, you take blue bubonic plague, which wiped out large parts of the population in Europe. We take um, the, what was called the Spanish influenza uh, pandemic that happened uh, in the early 1900s that, that, that uh, affected millions across the globe um, and several other influenza pandemics. Many of these have had zoonotic origins. Uh, we've, as, uh, you know, we've had more recently in the early 2000s, we had SARS, SARS-1, uh, which was of course of zoonotic origin. Then we had MERS. Uh, there are other more famous ones, the, the ones that make it to the movies, things like Ebola, and Marburg, which, uh, which are hemorrhagic fevers, and, uh, and in which the death rates are really, really high. Um, and these, of course, come from uh, very close relatives of ours, the primates, the big apes. Um, the most recent one, the one that the world is currently grappling with, COVID-19, is also, uh, well, it's, it's, it's uh, suspected to have come from, from bats because the closest relatives or the closest strains of this virus, the COVID-19 virus, uh, have been found in bats. And there's some evidence that pangolins may have been an intermediary host for this virus. Um, so we've had, you know, lots of uh, different outbreaks of zoonosis uh, across the world. In fact, we have, um, you know, uh, India, for instance, has, has had about, I don't know, about 10 to to 15,000 deaths, or probably less than that, or, uh, from COVID-19. But every year it suffers from 20,000 human cases of rabies. Now rabies is one of the oldest known zoonoses to humans. Um, across the world, something like 60,000 people die from rabies every year. And most of, this, most of, most of these cases come from dog bite cases. Um, so yeah, we know we're living with zoonoses all the time. Um while I have you, uh, you know, could you share with us the current status of wildlife trade in India and the policy framework and justifications regulating it? So, um, 
you know, wildlife trade in India was, was banned. Uh, so all hunting of wildlife in India was banned in 1972 when the Wildlife Protection Act of India uh, was, was uh, enforced by, by parliament. Uh, it was quite, quite a landmark law because overnight it changed it out. It made illegal the eating habits of millions of people. People were no longer allowed to consume wildlife. Um, and it was quite a, quite a drastic measure. Of course, the, the history of the enforcement of this act has been patchy, so to speak. Um, you know, we've had some really, really good conservation successes. Um, look, India, despite having one point, close to 1.3 billion people, still has most of its large charismatic megafauna. Okay, we've, had, we've only lost one species, one large carnivore, uh, in in our recent history, and that was due to uh, due to hunting and habitat loss. The the Asian cheetah, the Asiatic cheetah, we lost from India. But we still have the only population of Asian lions. We have the largest population of tigers, the largest population of Asian elephants, and many other species. Um, the the trade in wildlife itself um, in India is um, is quite interesting because. Uh, it's mostly, there are a few places where you have live markets uh, or you can get uh, wildlife, uh, wildlife is traded openly, but these places are few. Most of this trade is, um, is underground. Uh, and when, and you know, people that, that, uh, that are aware of it know where to go and find, find, uh, find wildlife products. Um, also the type of wildlife that's sold, uh, it's, you know, things like uh, for example, turtles or small game, uh, small small mammals, uh, reptiles of some sorts. Uh, for example, there's a thriving trade in um, what's called uh, earlier it was called Euromastics, but now it's called Sara Hardwicki, the uh, the spiny tail lizard. There's a lot of um, uh, wildlife products used in traditional medicine uh, in India that that still continues. There's a huge trade for snake uh, snake skin. Uh, and of course, pangolins are, are heavily traded. There is still an ongoing uh, hunting, of, uh, hunting for meat consumption, uh, as well as a way of controlling the population of animals that, uh, that uh, indulge in crop trading or in terms of uh, reducing human wildlife conflict or often in retaliation for human wildlife conflict. There was a massive trade for um, large carnivores a few years back. And that resulted in, so especially for tigers, uh, for the tiger uh, skin and bone trade. And that resulted in the extinction, local extinction of tiger populations from two reserves. These are of course very famous cases, the Sariska Tiger Reserve and the Panna Tiger Reserve uh, lost all of its tigers to poaching. Poaching is still a very important problem, but there's been a massive enforcement rally since then and um, India really changed its, its, uh, its methodologies for, for counting tigers to try and, try and fix some of those systemic issues. The science has improved, the, um, you know, the, the enforcement has improved and the networks of trying to control the dealerships have improved. So all of those things, uh, so there are some good, there are some good news uh, coming out of India in terms of trying to control the wildlife trade but it's still there. It's, it's very much there, especially for, for species that are sort of, you know, go under the radar. Okay, um, so my question is for Karen. Um, you know, China is considered to be one of the leading wildlife trade markets. Could you tell us what is, you know, so give us some idea of what is the volume of wildlife trade in China and where do these supplies come from? Uh, actually, yes. As you as you uh, are all aware th uh, that in the in the his historical like background that uh, there are some like um, uh, very di diversified reasons for Chinese people to uh, consume wildlife products. So, uh, for example, the like the social, cultural, and economic reasons. Uh, unfortunately, there's no like the uh, very accurate um, statistics on the uh, wildlife consumption volume. Um, but uh, I can say that uh, the Chinese people, uh, the the wildlife products. Uh, 
they, I mean, we consume in, in the market is both from uh, domestic and uh, as well as imported. So for those imported, uh, imported uh, uh, like the wildlife products, I have, um, I have some, some figures from the uh, announced by uh, Chinese uh, customs. So uh, the, num the, the number was from last year. So 2019, in the first uh, 10 months of uh, 2019, China Custom has uh, filed and investigated 40, uh, 444 cases of smuggling of endangered species and their products. So seized uh, 1,237 uh, 30, tons of various endangered species and their products. Um, the, in terms of the uh, proportion, is uh, an increase of 2.44 uh, 40, times and uh, um, 8.58 uh, times year on year uh, uh, statistics. So, including uh, these scissors, uh, in, uh, including uh, 150, uh, 57 uh, cases of smuggling of every products and uh, 9.16 tons of every products, uh, and, uh, and also as well as the um, pangolin, uh, pangolin scales. So this is the, uh, about the, um, uh, the, like the smuggling from overseas. Uh, for domestic, uh, like uh, wildlife animal consumptions, uh, it's, uh, we, we don't have the exact number, but I, I, I think it's, it's large, even larger than this, numbers thank you karen what about the you know the regulatory framework you know are there you know you talk you mentioned customs so is there a policy you know to uh, regulate the export and import or is there a policy for internal consumption you know are there are there limits are there you know laws that you know yeah yeah thanks so uh, yeah so in china there's uh, there are a couple of like uh, law laws uh, in terms uh, to regulate the wildlife uh, and uh, the their products consumption so one is the like the uh, the main uh, the main law of of the uh, of the country and the, the second one is the wildlife protection law so this is uh, this is uh, another uh, like the very detailed regulations um, so in terms of the, uh, the recent uh, uh, pandemic crisis, so I think the China government, they took a very quick uh, action. Um, on, on the, on the uh, 24th of February this year, so uh, the, the central government, uh, the NPC Standing Committee, um, uh, they approved the, ban the banning on illegal wild, wild animal trade and uh, e eradicating habit of eating wild uh, animals and secure people's life, health, and safety. So this is, uh, this is issued um, in February. And the purpose of this ban is to complete, completely ban and punish the illegal trade of wild animals and uh, to uh, e eradicate the bad habit of eating uh, wild animals maintain biosafety and eco security. So prevent major public health risks and secure people's life, health and safety. Uh, reinforce, reinforce the construction of ecological civilization as well as promote the harmony uh, between man and nature. So uh, after this, uh, I think uh, following uh, Abby's, uh, Dr. Abby's uh, his his um, debate on the uh, on the uh, pangolin and recently uh, chi China government uh, I mean the uh, the National Forest and Grassland uh, Authority they just upgrade uh, uplisted pangolin from national uh, national endangered species uh, the list uh, second. Uh, the second grade uplisted to uh, first grade. So uh, that means the pangolin is, um, is as, uh, as uh, precious as uh, giant panda. 
So uh, I see a lot of positive, uh, positive uh, development recently, but still uh, I have to say even the uh, wildlife protection law or the other like the um, this kind of regulations they have been there for years, but still we can see the uh, loophole of the law enforcement, and as well as the awareness, ban awareness among uh, the publics. Thank you. Thanks. Um, just on that note, you know, we so the in terms of the public, you know, is there a, is there a tradition of you know consuming wildlife? Are these part of people's cultural beliefs or their economic needs or uh, you know what has what are some of the cultural dimensions of that that are hard to change? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I think that's a good point. Since uh, China has a very long history, so thousands of years. So in uh, in the old uh, ancient times, uh, yes, the people, I mean the human being, they uh, they have to uh, consume uh, some of the wildlife for either for the purpose of the uh, of of living and uh, uh, also like for some medical purpose. So that's the in the ancient uh, ancient ages. But I think uh, in uh, in along with the development of the economy, I think uh, um, people uh, consume some some uh, wildlife uh, or the wildlife uh, products uh, due to like to show off their show, uh, to show their social status. Uh, for example, the ivory uh, is quite ivory, and uh, rhino horn is quite uh, quite expensive. So they want to show off their uh, their uh, wealth and their impact uh, on the um, on the like the, the whole uh, society. That's the social status they want to show show off, and uh, also uh, there are some culture um, culture reasons cultural reasons. For example, the uh, ivory carving is very uh, it's very beautiful and so it's kind of like the heritage uh, of of Chinese culture, and as um, also for some due to some medical purpose, uh, for example the rhino horn, um, some of the Chinese people they think it's the um, the powder of the rhino horn can cure some disease. Uh, I think the same the same to the bear balls and uh, tiger bones. Uh, the tiger bones, uh, they, they, uh, it, they, they said that um, the tiger bone, the, the uh, wine of the tiger bone can help uh, strong your own bone. So that's, that's the kind of saying. Uh, the, um, it's not scientific at all, but it's kind of like a historical uh, saying. And uh, for those uh, sell, sellers, I think it's, uh, it's because of their uh, economic uh, request since they want to sell this kind of products for uh, for like to, to make money so it's different yeah thanks yeah thank you so much so it, it shows us the complexity of tackling the program and of tackling this whole issue right both from the policy and and then the market and then people's habits um, it will come back to what could be done and what action points can be taken I'm going to turn over to you Wendy um, you have experience working in the US and also in in South Africa and uh, you know you can think of the US as an importing country and you know, South Africa is an exporting country in terms of global trade on, in wildlife products. Um, what kind of, um, you know, regulations have you found in each countries and what kind of, you know, um, activism and, you know, that you find addressing this issue? Sure. I mean, firstly, as you mentioned, in the country, the, the illegal wildlife trade truly is a global issue and we're hearing about it here from the perspectives of India and China and the US and, and South Africa. But in terms of its scale globally, it is the fourth largest illicit crime and market in the world, um, estimated between seven and $23 billion a year. So really every country is involved um, and it has different roles as importers, exporters, and transit hubs. So, you know, it may surprise people that the US is also a source for um, wildlife that's trafficked out of the country or wild plants as well. So the US, you know, there was a case of, of aloe plants from California being illegally trafficked out to South Korea. So it can be, America is, you know, mostly a um, demand country, you know, anything and everything can come here, including, you know, elephant ivory, rhino horn, but also source. Um, uh, 
and, and it's both the illegal and the legal trade. Um, so for the US, for example, the, the legal trade is last year was $4.3 billion industry. Um, that's wildlife products imported um, into the country legally. Um, that was 200 million live animals, <laughs> uh, including 175 million fish for the aquarium trade and 25 million other animals from frogs for food birds, uh, insects, reptiles, spiders, pretty much anything. Um, you know, and, and within that legal trade, the US Fish and Wildlife Service who are in charge here of monitoring all the, um, the legal and illegal trade in wildlife, they opened up 10,000 illegal wildlife trade in investigations just last year. So it truly is this huge global issue. Um, and I think with COVID-19 now there's an, an added dimension which is, what are the, the health risks that go along with the illegal and um, legal trade? Um, and as you mentioned, so while tomorrow from we work in South Africa, you know, on the ground, um, and what we see, you know, the big um, targets for poaching are, of course, elephants and particularly rhinos, where we are. Um, and it's, it's not just a wildlife trade issue, it's an issue for humans as well, and rangers are killed protecting wildlife. Um, so South Africa, you know, the rangers are very under-resourced trying to protect the wildlife in these protected areas and they do their best, but the ports, um, they, they definitely need stronger enforcement and <laughs> detection at the ports to um, help with the um, detection and seizure of illegal wildlife products. Um, and something I found quite astounding in, in preparing for this panel um, was also the size in South Africa, the legal wildlife trade. It's a big business. Um, I can take an example, giraffe. We have giraffe on our reserve. Um, and there were 321 permits, permits, legal permits for South Africa to export giraffe to China in three years from 2016 to 2019. And, um, you know, those those giraffe went to their purported destination, but these investigators went to those places later and could not find a giraffe, only nine of 321. So, you know, the animals end up in unintended places and the legal trade um, is also, you know, part of the bigger picture of the, the crisis. Um, yeah. <laughs> Wow, so you, you, you're pointing to a very interesting, so it's both legal, it's not all undercover. There's legal uh, aspects to it, which also complicate the issue and um, will definitely need to be addressed. So you, you talked about it as one of the biggest, you know, um, illicit, you know, crimes, that, you know, globally and at a global scale. What are some of the key international agreements in, on wildlife trade, you know, like international conventions like CITES, you know, Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora? Are they contributing to, um, you know, monitoring policy advocacy? I mean, do we find these are effective legislations or these are effective policies or effective platforms and fora globally, or um, we need new kinds of international agreements? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ravina, that's a very good question. It's very topical right now, actually. So there is no global agreement on wildlife crime itself. Um, CITES, which you mentioned, which is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, both wildlife, fauna and flora, has been around since 1973, so it's quite old. But it, it was really, it's really a treaty, an international treaty, a legal framework to regulate the trade in species threaten species so that they, it's so that it's sustainable and it doesn't threaten them with extinction. So that's what CITES was built for. You know, it has been used to try to help fight wildlife crime with some success. Um, you know, for example, with elephant ivory, um, but it hasn't really been that successful. I mean, you can take pangolins as an example. They were listed in 2016 as the most uh, CITES Appendix 1, you know, serious international protection. But we've seen in the last few years a huge increase in, in pangolin uh, seizures and, you know, mil tens of thousands plucked off the face of the earth, um, you know, to feed demand for their scales and particularly Africa now where, where they're coming from. So, you know, it isn't working. I think everyone sort of can see that it's just not working. So I think uh, in terms of what 
can be done. Um, there definitely needs to be global cooperation on treating wildlife crime as seriously as, as, as it is. I mean, the fourth largest crime in the world um, and, and, and resourcing it appropriately to that level. Um, so I think CITES can be updated. It's an existing agreement. It's hard to make new international agreements. Um, and I know that there are calls from the international community to, um, to improve CITES and to include in their considerations of listing species um, and protections for them and considerations of human and animal health. So that would be new. But there is a call to um, a new global initiative called End Wildlife Crime to try to address this gap in the international legal framework for wildlife crime. They want to create a, a new protocol under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. So really putting wildlife crime up there <laughs> with other crime to, to give it the level of attention and funding that it needs. So I think this shift is really coming because of COVID-19 and the realization that the wildlife trade impacts us. You know, I'm, I'm devastated to think that we could live in a planet where there's no rhinos or tigers or, you know, elephants left in the wild, but there's now another motivation that, you know, is propelling countries and NGOs uh, to try to really <laughs> give it more attention that it deserves at an international level. And the funding, I mean, it really needs funding. Absolutely. Um, and just, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much. I think that opens the door for us to think about what are some of the action points and the solutions that we can, you know, think about and derive from. Claudia, I'm gonna to turn to you. You've been, you know, interviewing conservationists, leading scientists, policy activists. Um, what, can you share with us some you know, concerns and some of their approaches for rethinking global wildlife trade that you've come across? Yes, thank you. Good morning. It's morning here in New York. And um, when you asked me to be part of this, this panel today, I called some of my sources and asked them for their most current take on these issues. And the thing that almost everyone said, and many people said they didn't want to be quoted specifically, because they work behind the scenes and with governments to try to create, effectuate some changes. The thing that most of them, excuse me, thought uh, was that we need new international conventions, beginning with out and out bans on wet markets throughout the world, uh, which they see as one of the greatest dangers to not just biodiversity, but to mankind. They see COVID-19 as a warning about what is essentially uh, the equivalent of weapons of mass destruction. They say that we have international conventions about nuclear non-proliferation. We have conventions about the ozone layer uh, of the atmosphere. And what we have seen about zoonotic diseases is that they are every bit as dangerous and that there are more coming unless we deal with it. And the place where this all hits, where as they say, in American colloquialism, the rubber meets the road, it's at the wet markets. And um, the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is in New York, uh, recently put out a study, and let me read to you what, what should be a warning sign to everyone. Uh, they say, uh, they're quoting a 2018 study, and they say, there are 300 viruses from 25 high-risk viral families that are known to infect people, yet scientists estimate there are around 1.7 million viruses from these same viral families that are not yet even discovered in mammals and birds, of which, and this is the most startling thing, 700,000 are predicted to have zoonotic potential. 700,000. That means as forests are encroached upon and as wildlife keeps getting traded and sent across international borders, 
the probability of COVID-19 happening or something even worse is enormous unless we take action, they say. Uh, what it would take is an extreme national and international consciousness about this, which one would think the current pandemic might produce. On the other hand, several of these researchers said to me, you know, we've had warnings before. SARS was a warning. Ebola was a warning. The hundreds of thousands of people who died from this and the millions who've been affected, I'm talking about COVID-19, that has to be a warning. But of course, the, the markets are only part of the problem. The attacks on biodiversity in general and the destruction of the natural world is an issue of health and safety for the whole world. But to think of this trade as the equivalent of a weapon of mass destruction, that will take some education. Uh, all of us who are living with the results of this pandemic, I myself have lost five people in my circle, um, and everybody I know has experienced this, makes it not abstract. And maybe because it's impacted so many people and has been so disruptive to lives, to economies, to the hopes and dreams of a new generation, my students, their futures are at risk. Um, maybe that will be a wake up call because the destruction of wildlife has always been kind of a marginal issue. The destruction of land as something far away if you live in the rich world in cities as I do. Um, but there is a change because we all know what, what can happen. Thanks. You make a very powerful point about this being, you know, a collective suffering, which can no longer, it's not abstract for anybody, something happening out there or affecting few people. And that this might be a very important galvanizing, you know, movement to get some action on this issue. I'll come back to, um, you know, to, to asking you more about what we could be doing. I wonder, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the biodiversity issue. So I want to turn to you, Karen. Um, and, you know, when we think Think about um, global biodiversity loss, which is uh, an important planetary boundary. You know, how is the wildlife trade affecting that? You know, could we? Are there any measures to that that we can we can come up with? And how is the World Wildlife Fund? You know, how are you all thinking about it, and how are you addressing it? Uh, yes, thank you. So, yeah, so the biodiversity uh, loss, according to WHO, is uh, is can have significant uh, direct human health impact if ecosystem services are no longer uh, adequate to meet social needs. So, in the, indirectly, changes in ecosystem services affect uh, affects lab, uh, livelihoods, income, and local uh, migration, and on, uh, occasionally may even cause political conflict. So that means that the uh, the um, biodiversity loss is a very uh, is a tragedy for not only for the those uh, wildlife, but as well as to the human beings. So which we don't want to see. Um, I have to say that illegal wildlife trade uh, is growing of uh, is is of growing and uh, direct threat to biodiversity and the development issues. So today, the illegal uh, the illegal wildlife trade in uh, in wild wild flora and fauna is one of the most uh, lucrative uh, types of tran transaction transaction uh, or organized crime which annual uh, revenues estimated around uh, 23 billion US dollars every year. So this is, uh, uh, this is excluding fisheries and timber. So it's very quite a uh, large amount. And we see it's, uh, it's um, our, the, the, the biodiversity is, is threatened by this kind of uh, wildlife, illegal wildlife trade. 
many of the experts I spoke to say that we shouldn't just focus on the underground trade. COVID-19 happened, they say, at a legal market. And that is part of the problem that, uh, yes, maybe at the source there is Ill illegality and there is uh, organized crime involved. But the first problem seems to be legality and that can be dealt with. There's a lot of positive feeling about what the Chinese government has done on a centralized level. There is also some concern that that doesn't translate down necessarily. Uh, people point to, for instance, the HIV pandemic and epidemic that the government in China, the central government had a very good position, but it didn't always translate down into regional situations and so the the growth spread and that there may be a similar situation now but there's got to become a worldwide consensus about both the legal and the illegal trade beginning with a worldwide statement about it all right thank you i mean just on that issue i mean can i turn to thank you karen and claudia i mean both for pointing out you know the the huge volume of both illegal and legal trade and that the action needs to be done on both fronts and that this is very important to you know not only for health reasons but also for the future of our planet right so this this biodiversity maintenance is extremely yeah. important i want to turn to you wendy because you know uh, what do you think about you know the effectiveness of the we talked you talked about it you addressed it earlier you know that you do have policies that are um, pretty significant but it's it's difficult to enforce right so can you talk about your work and how you came about to doing what you do mm -hmm. um, as as a civilian you know as a part of civil society and where do you see the role of civil society uh, mm -hmm. you know complementing what the government does or or then you know working around that yeah. yeah, great question. I think to Claudia's point, um, and I mentioned earlier that CITES you know, is an international trade agreement. It doesn't have the teeth to really enforce anything that's happening domestically within the borders of a country. Um, so while Tomorrow Fund, um, our mission is to save threatened and protected, uh, threatened species in um, Southern Africa and their habitats. And we've been involved um, Firstly, on the ground in South Africa, helping to fund the protection of and creation of new protected areas. So in, increasing safe space for wildlife and also funding other reserves, government reserves. You know, these rangers putting their lives on the line to um, protect wildlife often don't even have boots and uniforms. I mean, and COVID-19 is exacerbating that issue where it's caused such economic damage that those already inadequate budgets are now even more stressed. So, um, you know, it, it's this sort of negative feedback where the, the inaction or not enough action on the wildlife trade has caused this, this virus to emerge, which is now causing more challenges in protecting wildlife so that we don't have more viruses emerging from the forest. Um, so, yeah, we, and so that, I mean, it's really, Protecting in South Africa, the big um, target for poachers is rhinos. South Africa has 80% of the world's remaining African rhinos. Um, so it's a huge target and uh, ways that we've worked to help rhino reserves protect their rhinos is with equipping and training rangers and also dehorning to remove the horn, um, to remove the incentive for poachers to kill the rhino. Um, We've also had, we're really proud of this program where it was international collaboration, which I think more is needed, where New York law enforcement came voluntarily to Africa to help train rangers in wild, a very specific thing, which is wildlife crime scene forensics. That was to help them be able to collect the evidence at a poaching crime scene, which is just like a murder scene, you know, collecting ballistics and fingerprints to try to then be better able to, um, to prosecute wildlife crime. So there's so many 
uh, things <laughs> up the chain of the illegal wildlife supply chain that, that, that needs help and support from boots for rangers to training to, you know, more enforcement at the borders. And here in New York, I think is a really interesting example. So I'm proud as a New Yorker to say that New York State has very strict wildlife laws. In 2014, the state um, seriously, um, they closed loopholes in their wildlife laws, which meant for ivory specifically, specifically from elephants, you could no longer sell mammoth ivory. And mammoth was used as this loophole where a dealer in a store here in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue could have a big mammoth tusk or something that looked like ivory and say, it's mammoth, it's fine, you can buy this and it's totally legal. So it was used to, often you see these cases where the legal trade is used um, as a front for the illegal market and it sort of launders illegal products into the legal market. So here in New York, after they upgraded those laws and closed the loopholes, that opened the window for enforcement, this is state wildlife law offices, um, to do undercover investigations and um, bust these places. And uh, 2015 was New York State's biggest ivory bust in history. They pulled eight million dollars, eight million US dollars off the shelves of stores here in New York City. And actually it's really fascinating because everyday people like me and you and people walking down the street can can play a role. And hopefully that's true around the world where if you see an illegal wildlife product, something that you think is fishy, uh, you can report that to the authorities and, and they rely on it. Um, our friends at New York State Wildlife Enforcement say that we citizens are force multipliers. You know, they don't have the staff or the time to walk around all the stores here uh, and look for ivory or look for leopard skins, um, you know, hippo teeth, you know, there's all kinds of things that make their way to New York that, that threaten wildlife in far flung places. So they do rely on citizens to, to, to report if they see uh, illegal wildlife or what could be something illegal on the shelves. Um, they've also done big stings, you know, shark fins, eels, they've found sharks in people's basements alive for the aquarium trade. So there's a lot of crazy things happening even here in New York, which has very strong uh, enforcement of wildlife crime. Uh, thanks, Wendy. I'm going to ask you, Abby, you know, we've talked about, we've seen, I mean, it's a complex issue, right? When you talk about regulation and, um, and you think about the, and keeping spaces like you've uh, done, you know, these reserves which are protected and which you know encourage the nurturing and flourishing of you know animals you know large game animals in your case or you know um for a country like india you know and perhaps even in in south africa you have this constant tussle between what is considered the developmental goals of a country that is you know looking to boost its economy and livelihoods of people and then you look at space that is required for conservation right so that's one big t conflict that you do see um and another issue is the silo nature of how we look at it right we look at health under one lens and then wildlife trade or environmentalism as a almost a non-human kind of you know non dehumanized nature almost and i think those conversations between environmentalists and people who work on you know issues around um, you know health and human interaction are now beginning to um, emerge in very important ways and the the point the aspect of integrating them has become very important so uh, abhi talk about the one health platform and how you are attempting to do this um, yeah sure so i'll just uh, i'll just quickly um, remark upon upon one thing in that um, there was a recent paper in the journal lancet planetary health it was it was a, it was a letter it was a commentary which, which uh, argued that overselling these, the wildlife trade bans across the world may not bolster conservation or pandemic preparedness. And you know, there's a reason for this because um, we should also not fall into the easy trap, okay, of finding a scapegoat right now in wildlife trade. Okay, it is important to do, it is important to regulate wildlife trade, but as several of our panelists have mentioned, there's a broader 
um, underlying uh, uh, economic process that's been driving all of these changes in the last century, okay? We have to, I mean, think of it, even the COVID-19 pandemic barely caused a dip in the carbon emissions of our, of our lifestyles, okay? So uh, everybody's talking, talking about scaling, rapidly scaling back to our normal life when the normal life was the problem, okay? This was an opportunity for the world to say, hey, hang on, you know, let's think of, uh, let's think of where we can draw back. And, and, you know, there have been some casualties, for example, uh, I read that it was a British petroleum, maybe a shell that, that had, to had, to, had to scale down its own sort of uh, projections for future uh, oil consumption. But the fact is that it's our economic systems that have been driving all of these changes. I mean, we're not even talking about climate change right now. Climate change is going to exacerbate the threat of zoonosis far more than illegal wildlife trade because um, uh, let's also remember that illegal wildlife trade can, can increase the risk of emergence of a, of a pathogen, but the spread of that pathogen across the globe in a very short period of time is directly linked to our economic model. Okay, so, so we are only trying to fix symptoms right now. We're not looking at, at the overall problem. Okay, we still want to get back to get back to our normal lifestyles. Okay, um, how do we tackle some of these? Now, you you pose an important question. Um, now, you know, there's there's uh, uh, people have been looking at human health in a very siloed manner, and uh, I think almost for the last two decades now, many scientists have realized that you can't do this. In fact, in the 1960s in India, there was an excellent example of a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary approach to understanding uh, a disease that, you know, people were having trouble understanding. This was called, uh, you know, this was quite obscure. It's called Kyasunur Forest Disease. Um, it was, it was a, it's a tick-borne uh, disease that seemed to mysteriously affect monkeys and to also affect people. Um, and, uh, and so it took a real, a real interdisciplinary approach to understand the origins of this and how uh, this virus was affecting people. Unfortunately, in India, we uh, seem to have forgotten those lessons. And uh, uh, as you said, we've gone back to our silent approach. Health is seen, human health is seen as uh, the purview of doctors or public health professionals. Animal health is seen, uh, is seen solely as a preserve of uh, veterinarians and the animal health department and wildlife health surveillance is almost non-existent in India. Nobody talks about it. Um, so the One Health paradigm very simply says that if you want to have healthy humans, you also need to think about having healthy animals and a healthy environment. Um, and uh, by putting them all together, especially uh, in the context of zoonosis, is particularly important. Um, so that's one thing that we are working towards uh, in India right now to sort of launch uh, or get the One Health platform operationalized, get it going. Uh, we've uh, the government of India has recently launched the national mission on human well on biodiversity and human well-being, um, and uh, and a component of that is zoonosis and One Health. So we hope to really put a lot of money into operationalizing it by, by building teams, by encouraging team science, by building, uh, by bringing in people from different, uh, different uh, backgrounds and different uh, disciplines together so that they can start investigating uh, problems of human health from, from, a, pub, from, a, from a multidisciplinary angle um, and also look simultaneously looking at animal health uh, and linking it to human health. So, so think of it this way. Look, um, as I said, as I said right up front, uh, in India we live, we live, we have amongst the highest densities of humans. We also have amongst the highest densities of livestock. So we live with uh, really high densities. I mean, we are living together in very close contact. So our risk of transfer of of diseases is also very high. We also have 
for biodiversity hotspots. Okay, so um, the risk of spillover of novel viruses or novel strains of viruses from wildlife to either domestic animals or directly to humans is also high. So therefore we really need this integrated paradigm, this integrated one health system to sort of be sort of uh, both control existing uh, diseases that, are, that we already know about, but also to do horizon scanning to see what are the new dangers. As Claudia was mentioning, there's millions of different viruses out there potentially in, and thousands uh, that, that could uh, pose significant uh, risks to human health. So we need to be doing the surveillance right now. Uh, and we need to really be upping our public health systems to be able to deal with and tackle any emerging, uh, emerging threats that, 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 that are on the horizon. Um, thanks, Abhi. I'm going to turn to you, Claudia, and ask you about uh, media. You know, what role do you think the media can play? What role have they been playing in thinking about, you know, wildlife trade and thinking about its effects on health? Uh, you know, are there any positive uh, platforms? You know, do we see the print media or the social media, you know, positively? And what, what, what needs to be done? Do we need to train journalists on this? What, what, what do you think could be done on that? Right? Yeah. Well, I, I think certainly the North American media is always very focused on the, on the issue at hand, the crisis at hand. And at the moment, COVID is it. And so I see that conservationists see that this is a moment that they can get their story up front as they couldn't before. I mean, they're... Uh, conservation issues, wildlife issues, were kind of on a back burner. They they weren't hot stories, as the phrase goes. Um, and this is a moment because it does impact so many people's lives that you can get these stories wider. Now, you asked about social media. Uh, one of the things social media has done, which is quite remarkable, is because people have cameras and because they don't have intermediaries, a greater sense of the natural world is permeating beyond the news because of the pictures people take uh, in the wild, uh, of animals, of nature. Uh, stuff is getting out that we never saw before particularly about the sentience of animals, about their cultures, about the way they behave. And that's kind of, at least in the West, where there is a kind of separation from those ideas uh, permeating. And, and that's the way social media has really had an impact. Um, I'd like to, though, go back to a question that Abi raised about the way these issues are siloed. And that affects the media too. Um, many of the researchers I know say that we should be thinking, yes, it's siloed, but uh, in, certainly in the West, people think economically about everything. Um, and the economic costs of the wildlife trade are so enormous to everyone that now is the issue that now you can get these issues considered. They do not oppose uh, wildlife hunting or eating by indigenous peoples in rainforest areas or in Alaska or in the Arctic, but they oppose the trade going wider than that. And they are trying to say, I think, that the economic benefits of this multi-million dollar, billion dollar trade benefits only a few internationally and that it has to stop because the cost is so enormous in lives and in economies. And that's the message they're trying to get into the media. And to some extent, they've been successful at it. Will that last? I don't know, uh, but this pandemic is not going away that quickly. And the numbers of people it impacts, as we all know, is enormous. Um, 
you know, thank you. You've all given some very amazing ideas for us to think about, you know, on how we can upgrade agreements like CITES and how we can look at enforcement and monitoring tactics, how we can rethink our siloed approaches into creating, you know, collaborative platforms, which enable us to think out of the box um, and, and, and also redefine what the normal is, you know, what the boundaries are between the human and natural world in that sense and see ourselves as part of that natural world. Um, we've, thought, we've talked about civil society action and awareness building for campaigns, including, um, you know, looking at media as a powerful uh, ally and how that can happen happen and what, what's required for that. We've also talked about, you know, actually venturing into, you know, ourselves protecting spaces and reserves. Um, we've talked about, you know, organizations like uh, World Wildlife Fund and, and the work that they're doing in, in the monitoring space as well. And, um, you know, running effective campaigns uh, to, to raise awareness on issues like ivory. So a lot of interesting and wonderful ideas have come from you all. There are a lot of questions, so I'm going to, you know, curb my own and turn to some of the audience questions, and I think um, you will enjoy answering those as well. So the first question is um, addressed to Karen, um, and, and also to you, Wendy. Do you have any um, observations to suggest how are private players coming forward to invest in wildlife protection and conservation? We've mostly talked about you know, the government. Do you see this as industry forward as well, Karen? And then I'll turn to you, Wendy, on this question. As we see that the, um, there, there's going to be like joint efforts from all the uh, all the sectors uh, of the society. So um, we, uh, um, WWF is, uh, is encouraging and as well as the, uh, we are uh, trying to engage the corporates in our daily, uh, daily conservation work. For example, we uh, try, we set up uh, the, uh, uh, a couple of uh, alliance with like uh, like uh, on e-commerce e e companies to address the uh, like the um, to address their online uh, online uh, shops and advertisement, and as well as uh, kind of we are also uh, trying to um, set up the sustainable tourism. So with a lot of like uh, tourists uh, there uh, to um, since uh, we we found we found that. For example, the ivory. Uh, we found that the uh, Chinese uh, outbound travelers they are the they are the uh, potential buyers since uh, the ivory ban to totally banned in China. The in this uh, in in the domestic market. So uh, we found that those kind of uh, uh, outbound travelers they might go uh, out abroad to buy some every products, uh, especially in neighboring countries. So that's what uh, we are doing and trying to uh, set up a collaboration with the uh, private sector. Thank you. Great. Yeah, Wendy? Yeah, Baltimore Fund, the, the habitat that we've pr protected so far in Southern Africa, it's really been quite a grassroots effort with hundreds of people, individuals, actually thousands who've donated, you know, from $20 up to tens of thousands of dollars to be a part of this dream to save land and um, protect it for, to expand habitat for wildlife. So, um, you know, in a sense, we, we're an NGO that owns that land, but we're not a government. So we are a private owner of that land. Um, and actually across South Africa, there's a lot of private ownership of land that's been turned to private wildlife reserves and they tend to be better funded you know we've seen and an example that's quite sad is the the government uh, reserves are so underfunded in our region in Zululand that they almost they, they actually have a custodial program where they've given their rhinos over to a private reserve near to us kind of to say we can't keep them safe they're going to get shot they're going to get killed please you take them and so there are actually rhinos as at, you know, at, at private reserves where they have more funding and better equipped rangers to keep them safe under an agreement where, you know, they'll eventually return them. But for now, when they have new rhino babies, one belong, it's sort of a 50-50 share where one rhino will belong to the private reserve and the next one goes back to the government when they can keep them safe. So I think that's interesting. And South Africa's recognized the value of private or NGO, you know, ownership of land in protecting their biodiversity. And I don't know how much 
in total it is, it's probably close to 40, 50% is privately protected. Um, and so what we're doing with our reserve, we're in this process of declaring it as a nature reserve under South Africa's biodiversity stewardship laws. So it means that as a, us as an NGO, or if you're a private owner, you can have your land assessed and make sure it has that biodiversity value that's important to the country and have it declared, you know, there's a scale, but um, you know, for our reserve, it will be declared at the same level as the state national park as a nature reserve. So there's legislation in South Africa that helps kind of, or acknowledges the role of private individuals in, in protecting biodiversity. And, um, you know, to, to reflect on what Dr. Abby said and, and the sort of wider <clears throat> issues outside of the wildlife trade and why we find ourselves in this situation with the pandemic, I read a really great quote. It said, the vaccine for COVID-19 was natural habitat. And, you know, I think Claudia will love this reference to E.O. Wilson. If we want to save 80% of species on our planet, we need to basically put aside or, or en enable 50% of land and, and uh, sea to be used as wild habitat, which doesn't mean people are excluded, but that wildlife can be protected there. So for, for me um, and Wild Tomorrow Fund, we, we think this pandemic is really a reflection of our overall relationship with nature, the natural world, that we're totally dependent on ecosystems, functioning ecosystems for human health, clean air, clean water, but we're destroying it. Um, and so, these consumptive activities, commercial scale, um, consumption of wildlife is really what has put us in this situation. And so for, I think the cure is, is basically rethinking our, our relationship with nature and um, protecting nature. Thank you. Abby, this is a question for you. Um, what about um, the 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 person asks, what is the role, it's a Mihir Herlekar, what is the role of intensified livestock production increasing in, in increasing the risk of zoonotic diseases? Um, thanks, that's a, that's a really ex excellent question. And um, in, in a lot of sense, that gets to the heart of the problem. Um, so, you know, when you, when you have, so, th you know, the, the gluttonous consumption of meat, in in uh, in the global north, okay, has resulted in these uh, factory production systems where um, not just beef but also plants, okay, where uh, agricultural both crops, agricultural crops and uh, and animals are grown through this sort of factory production system. And what's also what's happened is that they're they've been bred to grow very fast, okay which means they are pumped up with growth uh, hormones and with routine uh, antibiotic use, okay? They have that, which means, you know, they also have very little innate immunity to a lot of diseases. Um, they're also grown in really crowded conditions, whether they be, whether they be cattle lots or poultry farms or pig styes, uh, pig farms. And they're really heavily packed together and this creates sort of like almost the ideal condition for novel pathogens to um, to spill over from from a from a potentially from a wild reservoir um, into into these domestic systems and then just go out of control. Okay, so the factory production system, the animal uh, factory production system, is is really crucial um, in in the increasing the risk of zoonotic diseases emerging to humans, because of course, um, you know, we are next in line after that. See, for, for, a, for a new pathogen to emerge from a wild host, it has to go through several steps, okay? But when it comes from a domesticated animal, it's already short-circuited a few of those. And so it, it reduces the distance um, that that host, or it reduces the number of hoops that that pathogen has to go through to infect humans. Also, um, it's it's not just one transmission event that can uh, that can sometimes trigger uh, a human chain. It's multi it often requires multiple transmission chains. So our continued close contact with these animals can result in this sort of uh, barrage, and then eventually it, it it just takes off and and causes uh, causes an epidemic or a local outbreak. Um, 
What we instead need to be doing, and I'll just make a quick point here, is, is that we, by, by focusing on these mass production systems, we're undervaluing um, our traditional methods of growing, growing animals, okay? And, uh, and the close linkages that animal production systems had with food production system and the food security and nutrition that it provided. Okay, local breeds are often uh, resilient. In fact, that's how they've been developed. They've been, they're resilient to pathogens that, are emer that emerge in the local environment that those animals are bred in. Okay, by, by sort of, uh, by taking that out and having these high producing hybrids brought in, you are actually, uh, you're, you're sort of shooting yourself in your foot and you're opening yourself up to the dangers of these, uh, of these emerging viruses and, and, and other pathogens. Thanks. Another question actually asks about, you know, com local communities that have been consuming bush meat or wildlife meat. And is it fair to have a blanket ban then? And how do you account for, you know, their own needs of, for sustenance or cultural food habits? So how do you address so that? I, I would, I would, I don't, I don't, um, uh, encourage any blanket bans of any sort, in fact. Um, look, let's think of it. Again, this, I, I just come back to the thing. People who are, uh, who are subsistence, who are subsistence farmers or subsistence consumers did not cause this problem of, of this pandemic. Um, in fact, in most cases, they have very little to do with it. Uh, in India, we saw that it was, so, so it's a classic case in India. I mean, you know, for, uh, the, the pandemic, the, as, as across most of the world, it was imported, it came, it came into cities, okay, by the fairly well-to-do, all right? And because of the drastic lockdowns and all of those that had to be put into place, the people who suffered the most were the poorest sections. And then they had to walk, they had to leave these cities, go to their villages, and then they took this problem, and they took a rich urban problem and distributed all across to the poorest families across India, okay? So the idea that we should, you know, target the poorest, most vulnerable communities for, in a sense, what is a rich person's problem is, is inherently unfair. Um, and, it, um, uh, and it's this inequity that's actually causing most of the problems that we see today. Uh, we continue to lose forests, even in India right now, we continue to lose forests, not because of small scale clearance, but because of mining for coal um, that's going to feed the energy hungry cities. There's, there are new linear intrusions being planned into fairly dense uh, rainforests in the Western Ghats even now. In fact, the pandemic, the, the, the lockdown was used as a time of, of clearing multiple projects. There's a massive uh, oil well uh, blowout that's happened in, in, in Northeastern India. And at the same time, the, the, uh, the, the wildlife, uh, the National Board for Wildlife cleared even for even more uh, oil um, explorations in protected areas. So we just have the wrong end of the stick here. Okay, it's, it's our global consumption patterns that we need to keep a check on, not what the not not the poorest communities for whom you know a few few grams of protein that you can get from animal sources actually leads to very high nutrition security. Um, so again, wrong end of the stick here is what I feel. Uh, Claudia, I have a different question for you, and this is um, you know a question um, ask. You've been doing a lot of training, you know, for journalists um, and for uh, scientists, right? On how do you use the media, and then for journalists, perhaps on issues around science. So, um, how do we, if there's everything is so siloed, how do we get the e economists to think about ecology? And this is a question. Oh, well, if I understood how to reach economists, I'd probably win a, a Nobel Prize. Um, I, I think um, there are several questions within that question. The first is that I think everybody needs to know more science if we're to be good citizens, because science impacts our lives every day. And so I think journalists need to know more science. Very few journalists are that uh, scientifically knowledgeable, and we only need to see 
how the journalists covering the White House and the White House's press conferences on the COVID-19 pandemic, which were daily, weren't always fully equipped about how to answer or question falsehoods or exaggerations or inaccurate information that they were given because they didn't quite know the details of their science. So I think science literacy is certainly a problem in the United States. It's less of a problem perhaps in your part of the world among journalists. I, I'm not sure. But uh, in, in certainly in the United States, most liberal arts majors and students consider um, so the science classes that they have to take as undergraduates as the equivalent of castor oil or some kind of punishment. It's very badly taught. And so they don't know the basics. So yes, we need journalists to be better educated in the sciences, especially since it impacts every area of our lives. The other thing is, how do we get economists to say that this is important? Well, I think more the question is, how do we get citizens to say this is important? And happily or unhappily, this may be the moment when you can reach people. Thank you. There's a different type of question and I don't know who wants to answer this. Um, what's the connection between wildlife trade and the, the fashion industry market? Is that a relevant market which is generating a lot of wildlife trade? What once was or maybe. Um, and I think this is an example where a media campaign, at least in the US context, had some impact and it may be a model. Uh, certainly the Ill, making the uh, use of certain kinds of wild furs illegal mm -hmm. and then there's sort of being a societal agreement that you don't walk around wearing a leopard coat uh, made uh, made it very difficult to uh, it, at least in the U.S. to sell those kinds of wildlife products. That, but as other economies emerge and grow wealthy and they don't have these prohibitions, uh, they are a market. And um, today in, uh, yesterday in the New York Times, there was a huge piece on the destruction of jaguars in South America and in Latin America. And the general consensus is that those products are going uh, to China. And um, so something has to happen in China that's comparative that makes it socially unacceptable for wealthy people to wear products of endangered wildlife. Uh, Wendy, to you. So uh, just one comment on what uh, Claudia mentioned, the, the story about the Jaguars in Brazil and fashion. Um, you know, I sent that very article to the wildlife detective here at New York and he commented that, you know, they'd found a few of those pelts here in New York, but, you know, basically the, the Jaguars are, populations were, were decimated by demand for fur in the US, you know, in the past. So we've gone through that educational process, as you mentioned, and I think, it's, it, it really highlights how important it is for new markets to, to start to view wildlife in different ways. So I thought that was an interesting example. And also, I mean, pangolins. Pangolins were in demand for leather here, for cowboy boots, you know, in the past, but we've moved past that. So I think it's just a matter of though, do these animals have time, you know, for uh, culture and, and, and um, values to change, you know, before it's too late. As it turned out, you know, there was a massive uptick in tiger skin trade in the early 2000s. And a lot of that was going to Tibet um, because it became very fashionable in Tibet to wear uh, tiger and leopard skin. And, and I remember Belinda Wright and uh, Debbie um, uh, going undercover and doing an investigation there. And then they finally convinced the Dalai Lama to, to, to uh, influence uh, Tibetan Buddhists to give up that and that 
that pretty much quell that. So, so you know, f fashion doesn't necessarily have to be just associated with uh, with what we recognize as, as high fashion in the West. And it's even local fashion um, trends that can drive drive wildlife trade. Um, uh, on that note, Karen, and this is a question that's been addressed to all of you, um, and it it starts off from the context of looking at the unknown, you know, zoonotic risk, you know, the unknown viruses out there. So what is the role of what kind of investments in research and, and studies, um, you know, would be most useful, according to you, Karen? Um, I think uh, following on the like the comments and uh, like the questions we discussed uh, uh, today, I think uh, it, it's, it is going to be very helpful if we could like, uh, I mean, uh, to have some like uh, official data, I'm, I mean the official real statistic data for us to uh, on, on like the wildlife uh, stockpile as well as the, uh, the consumption, uh, some information uh, from the government that would be uh, very helpful for us to um, to um, to like plan plan uh, our future work and to pr uh, provide our uh, think tank function to the to the government. Thanks. I'm going to address yes, Abi, to you and anything on the data gap or the research and the studies part of it or anything else you'd like to share. Um, in terms of the science that we need to do. Uh, for discovery, I think we really need to do a lot of surveillance. Uh, we really need to up our surveillance. Our One Health surveillance game needs to be really upped. Uh, I know there were several projects that were um, that were in the pipeline, and we need to do a lot of funding. Uh, the, the global community needs to come together and put in a lot more money in trying to understand uh, the, you know, the virus fear or the 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 diversity of pathogens that we have out there, which could pose risks uh, to humans, and also try and understand their pathways and how this could change. Because as, as, as we are altering habitats on an almost continuous basis, and as climate change is gonna change the way animals are moving around in the landscape, um, we are gonna suffer the risk of uh, not just emerging diseases, but re-emerging diseases, things that we had already dealt with, dealt with in the past. Uh, through new, through either old pathways or through potentially new pathways as animals move around uh, and as, you know, the weather systems change, the rainfall patterns change, um, a lot of changes are coming our way and we need to be able to sort of think ahead now and try and find ways of, of um, adapting to those changes and certainly try and mitigate it wherever possible. Uh, so we really need to be doing a lot of science uh, in, in this case. Okay, I think we're almost out of time. So I want to just take this moment to thank all of you for participating, for sharing your views. I also want to acknowledge um, uh, the students who've joined us from W.A. Cunningham, IS234 school in Brooklyn um, and to our wonderful global audience, um, you know, um, the, in different parts of the world. Uh, this is a very important topic and I know that we've heard several perspectives from you, Karen, uh, from Wendy, from Abby, from Claudia, and I think, um, you know, the conversation has just begun and we hope at the Columbia Global Centers to carry this forward and, um, and to stay connected. So thank you for joining us and thank you for, for the, the wonderful uh, you know, knowledge that's shared by our experts. Um, see you soon.